Matthew chapter 20. You know, a recent article in CNN Money shows that um, millennials, in the 10 years after they graduate from college, millennials typically will work for an average of four employers during the first 10 years after college. That is twice as many as Gen Xers, the generation that preceded them, and four times as many as the boomer generation. And as uh, young people, this next generation, are contemplating that they have lots of choices who they want to work for and where they want to work, certainly there's many intangibles. The relationship with management, the relationship with employers, the work environment, and those intangibles are extremely critical. But as you probably aren't too surprised, another factor that's critical and key importance is the idea of benefits and compensation. And, and as many of us are contemplating where we're going to work, who we want to work for, what are the benefits that are most important, I want to encourage you to consider this with me. The best environment and the greatest compensation package that you'll ever contemplate is choosing to work for God as you choose to advance his kingdom as you choose to work for Jesus. You're never going to find a better work environment. You're never going to find a greater benefit package. And I believe if we really understood the rewards that we're going to receive as we serve God, it would motivate us to spend more time advancing God's kingdom and being sensitive to those opportunities and less time striving for gain in this world. And I want to encourage you, as we unfold this parable of the vineyard workers, we're going to discover that together this morning. Would you stand with me, if you're able, as we honor the word of God and the God of the word. We're in Matthew chapter 20. I'm going to read out loud through the first seven verses, and I'm going to ask you to follow along silently. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now, when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour, and he saw others standing in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Again, he went out about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle. And he said to them, why have you been standing idle all day? And they said to him, because no one hired us. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, you will receive. Let's pray. Father, I pray that we would discover that you are the best one to serve. And Lord, as we serve you, let us have confident hope that you reward us justly, generously, graciously, and Father, let us with a sense of anticipation be focused on serving you as we serve others. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our hearts to receive, that by your spirit, through your word, we would be transformed people living with purpose and mission in this life. And we ask this now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please be seated. So this morning we're going to consider the parable of the vineyard workers, the parable of the vineyard workers. And I believe the objective that God has in store for us is that we would receive Christ and we would serve him, that we would receive Christ and that we would serve him. Remember the context here. At the end of the 19th chapter, Jesus had had an encounter with a very wealthy young man who was a leader in the synagogue. And this man went away because his possessions, his love for this world, had a greater hold on him than God's love was attracting him. And as he went away, uh, Peter says, what about us, Lord? We've given up everything to follow you. To which Jesus assures him that not only would they experience or inherit eternal life, but for everything that was sacrificed by the apostles and all other disciples for God's sake, motivated by love for God and his glory, would be rewarded a hundredfold. Now, in light of that, in the context, what we're seeing here in the parable of the vineyard workers is Jesus amplifying that teaching, amplifying that exchange. And here's the main idea. Here's the key idea I want to encourage you to see. That God will reward fairly, generously, 
and graciously. I want to encourage you to write that down. And we might know this today. That God will reward fairly, generously, and graciously. So as we contemplate this parable of the vineyard workers, the first idea is that the workers were hired for a fair wage. The workers are hired for a fair wage. So it starts off, and, and Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of God, is like. And so a parable is an earthly story that comes alongside to explain a spiritual truth. Parables are earthly stories that come alongside to provide us a spiritual principle or a spiritual truth. And in this story, we're seeing that there is a master of a vineyard or an owner of the vineyard, and that is presumably Jesus. And he goes out early in the morning to hire workers. Those who become his workers are presumably disciples. So it's a sense this is Jesus' kingdom, and these are his followers that are involved here in this parable. He hires them Early in the morning, uh, the Talmud, the rabbinical commentary on law of Moses, goes on to explain that at the grape harvest, work would begin at sunup and work would end at sundown. The grape harvest typically takes place in August. And as the grapes are, are ripe and the grapes are at the perfect point of perfection, they need to be harvested in a hurry. And all of the grapes need to be brought in before the fall rains begin that would damage the crop. And so there's a sense sense of urgency. The master of the vineyard goes out, and there's day laborers. We, we are familiar with this in our culture. We see workers out for the fields who are looking for daytime work, laborers looking for daytime work, and so it's familiar to us in our culture as well. And so he agrees with them at verse 2 to pay them a denarius. So a denarius was a, a coin used in the Roman Empire that was the typical wage for a laborer. Also, it was the typical wage for one day of a soldier's pay. So it's a fair price for a fair day of work, a full day of work. But after he hires these guys to work a full day at starting at sunup, he goes out, and I need more laborers. And so he goes out at 9 o'clock, then goes out at noon, then goes out at 3 o'clock, then goes out at 5 o'clock. And he says to each of those successive groups, I will give you a fair wage. I will do what is right. And they trust him, and they're willing to work, and they go into the field and they do the work. So that's the, the context that we see, first of all, that the workers are hired for a fair wage. But then we see that the workers are rewarded fairly, generously, and graciously. Look with me beginning at verse 8. So, when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, Call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. And when those came who were hired about the 11th hour, they each received a denarius. But when the first came, they supposed that they would receive more, and they likewise received each a denarius. And when they had received it, they complained against the landowner, saying, These last men have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us, have borne the burden and the heat of the day. Verse 13. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do with what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? So the last will be first and the first last. For many are called, but few are chosen. So imagine the scene. So uh, now at the end of the day, the sun is going down. The master gets his steward and says, okay, call all the laborers to come in to get paid. And here I want you to line them up. So those who came last will be paid first. So imagine this group. You've got guys who worked for one hour. You have a group that worked for three hours. You have a group that worked for six hours, a group that worked for nine hours, and a group at the very end that worked for 12 hours. So here comes the steward, and he's giving out the paycheck, so to speak. The first guys come, and they get a Daenerys, and they've only worked one hour. Now, put yourself in this scene. When I put myself in that scene, if I'm at the back of the line and I'm watching these guys get paid who worked one hour and they got a full pay, I'm thinking to myself, cha-ching, right? 
Like, I am in the bonus. If these guys got a denarius for one hour, what am I going to get working all day? And so the next group comes through, and the next group comes through, and I'm just waiting, like, wow, here's a bonus. I'm going to get two denarii today. And then the steward hands me my one denarius, and I'm thinking to myself, man, I've been out here all day. It was hot. I bust in my back. These guys work for one hour and they get the same amount, and I'm thinking, that's not fair. And now I'm grumbling, I'm complaining. I know none of you would ever do that at work. <laughs> it's just, just sharing a personal testimony. Don't, don't feel convicted, right? This isn't fair. I deserve more, right? None of us would ever go there. Okay. So now I start to grumble and complain. So the master, at verse 13, he rebukes one of them, but it's a gentle rebuke. He says, hey, friend, hey, uh, you said you'd work for Daenerys for the day, and I gave you Daenerys. And if I want to give these other guys more, it's mine. Can't I do that? Wow. Yeah, I, I, I guess so. And then... Just says at verse 15, is your eye evil because I am good? Now, there's certain cultures like the evil eye. You know, you give someone the evil eye, it's like putting a curse on them. That's not what the idiom means from a Jewish perspective, from a, a biblical perspective. The evil eye speaks of a jealous eye. He's like, are you jealous because I was gracious or generous to these people? And then Jesus says, for the last shall be first and the first shall be last. Not necessarily uh, indicating to us that this will be the order of rewards that those who receive Christ. Then the idea here is that we will be surprised in regard to God's rewards. Some of the people that we didn't expect to get great rewards are going to have amazingly great rewards in heaven. And similarly, some of the people that we thought were going to be living large and in charge aren't. Here's the sense. We tend to think in the, the context of the local church, the pastors, you know, the teachers and the leaders, the, those are the ones who are going to be really rewarded from God. Maybe. Lord willing. But then there's this thought about, man, the, the children's ministry worker, right? The, yeah, the children's ministry worker who nobody remembers except for the kids. But nobody remembers, and sometimes in the context of the church. Life. But Jesus said, uh, suffer not the little children to come to me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, Jesus wants to bless the little children. And those who are a blessing to the children, who help bring the children to Christ, are presumably going to be rewarded greatly by Christ because he cares intensely about the little children. And so when we get into heaven, our minds are going to be blown about the extent of the rewards. And who received them? There was one day when I was working, practicing law. And uh, man, this is like a lifetime ago. And I remember my employers, the, the two senior partners of the firm, asked me to come into one of their offices. And they're both there. And they said, close the door. <laughs> right? Like when your employer says, Close the door. Your heart just starts, I'll just speak for myself, my heart's like jumping out of my skin. I'm thinking like, oh my gosh, what did I do wrong? And they say, have a seat. Well, that doesn't help. <laughs> I was like, no, I I'll just stand, you know. Uh, and so my employer opens up a drawer, takes out a can of Mauna Loa macadamia nuts and a plastic lake. You know where this is going, right? And says, we're sending you to Hawaii. Right? Yeah. Um, all that to say, just a little moral of the story. Sometimes the rewards are surprising. Right? And, and this is what Jesus is, is cueing us in this parable. Sometimes the people that we thought are the, the greatest, uh, we miss it. You know, sometimes in my experience as, as a pastor and, and going to minister to people towards the winter of their life and that season of life where they're preparing to stand before the Lord. I've heard people say to me, you know, Pastor, all, all I can do is pray now. I, I used to be able to do this and this and this and the other thing to serve God, but now all I can do is pray. And I'm thinking to myself, are you kidding me? Is there anything better that we could be doing but prayer? Amen. 
man. And, and so certainly, you know, if we could simply understand that every time we are in prayer, declaring our dependence upon God, praising God, offering intercession and supplication for others and ourselves, that God is glorified, that we are satisfied. And in that, when it's done with the right motive, we are earning heavenly rewards. And we are going to be very surprised, my friends. Very surprised. And so we understand uh, this context. Is, it goes on to say and, and at verse 16 that there are many who are called, but few are chosen. Some manuscripts om omit that verse. But the, the idea here is that those who don't enter into the work of the king, those who don't enter into the father's business may not be citizens of the kingdom. We, we have to understand that being a citizen of the kingdom is certainly different than being a part of a church community in, in the sense that you can worship regularly, you can visit a church and be part of a church community and engage in religious practices as a consumer, as a customer of religion. But if you're part of a community of faith, then you're going to also appreciate that as part of the community of faith, that each one of us has the privilege and the opportunity to serve God. And we have been uniquely gifted to serve God to advance his kingdom. Do you believe that? Right? And, and uh, I presume each of your households, either growing up or as a parent, there was that experience where each one understood that they had a part to play. Whether you called it chores, whether you called it family responsibility, and that progressively, as the years of maturation and development take place, there's a greater sense of the role, the greater sense of the responsibility, and the motivation is no longer allowance. The motivation becomes love because you're part of a family and that's how the body of Christ is there's no consumers we're disciples we're disciples who are part of the family of God now as you contemplate why we should serve Jesus I would suggest that there are countless reasons why we should serve Jesus and we will never exhaust all the good reasons why we should serve him but I want to focus if I can with you on three reasons three reasons why we should serve Christ I want to encourage each of us to consider this uh, the first reason is that Jesus rewards justly or fairly that Jesus rewards Fairly. So we see with the first guys who are hired at verse 2, he says to him, hey, work today and I'll give you a denarius. That was a fair wage. He's offering them a fair wage. But with each successive group, verses 3 to 7, he says, come work in the field and I'll give you what is right. I'll give you a fair wage. And what I want to encourage you to see with me and what I would encourage you to note, to write down, Jesus always does what's right. Jesus is always going to do justly. And this is important to understand because the world that we live in does not compensate workers justly. There's great inequality. There's gender inequality. Two equally qualified people for a position with the same level of skill, aptitude, and experience will in all likelihood in our culture be compensated differently simply because of their gender. That's unfair. Similarly, there's a lot of people with advanced degrees who are working in jobs that are grossly underneath the level of qualification that they have. They are underemployed for the skills and the abilities and the aptitudes. It's unfair, but it is. Similarly, there are many people who are looking for work, who are qualified for work, who are gifted, who have a great attitude, and find themselves either underemployed or unemployed. In a certain sense, that is unfair. There is a gross disproportion between CEO compensation, especially in largest corporations, and those of the typical laborers of that corporation. And that inequality also arguably is unfair. The world that we live in is going to be unfair in its compensation. And we can lament it, we can shake our fist at it, we can grieve, or we can understand that in some respect, God has allowed this in this fallen world so that we do not keep trying to find our satisfaction in the compensation of this world. Amen? Now, here's, here's another thought along this line. 
1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 8 to 15 makes it clear to us that the only people who earn rewards are people who have first received Christ and second are seeking to work for Christ with the right motive. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, there the Apostle Paul is talking about the rewards that believers receive. And each work that's done by believers is tested to see if its motive is pure. If the motive is to advance God's kingdom, if the motive is in response to love, if the motive is a response to the gospel, what God has done for us, it is rewarded. And not all service to the Lord is done with a pure motive. Let me just encourage you to write this down. Motive matters. Motive matters. Now, you might think it's unfair that only people who have received Christ and only the works that are done after we receive Christ earn rewards. Now, let me just consider this with me. Um, can unbelievers do charitable, kind, selfless acts of, of mercy and goodness in the world? A amen? It's not a trick question. It's obvious. Yes, they can. The issue is they're not motivated to do it to advance God's kingdom, nor are they doing it in response to God's love that they've received. They're not seeking to love others or do good to others in response to the love that they have received from God. And so the motive matters. So all those good deeds that are done prior to receiving Christ aren't earning eternal rewards. Now you might think, well that just doesn't seem fair, but think about this. Consider some of the employers in our community at large, our county for example, that have great benefits package, you know, a benefit package that is renowned, and you imagine walking into the HR department, and it's like, yeah, I've heard there's an amazing benefits package, and I want to receive mine. And they're like, okay, what department do you work in? Oh, I don't work here. But I work really hard for someone else. It's like, why do you expect to receive benefits here if you work somewhere else? Security, right? So that idea is it's not until you start to work for Christ, you're, you're about your father's business, that you should have any expectation receiving reward. Now, along this idea that motive matters, uh, the first job that I had in a local church after getting saved I was uh, primarily motivated by accountability to grow. I was a brand new believer. I was encouraged by one of the leaders in this church to show up, and, and here was going to be my job. I was going to set up chairs at the community center. And so next week I showed up, and I started to develop some relationships with other people who set up the chairs, started to develop relationships with other people who were there in the morning, had something to do each week that caused me to come back to the church, and it created great accountability to encourage growth. At that point in my Christian life, that's all I knew, knew was that I needed that accountability and that was motivating me. But I'll tell you, not only did I get to set up the chairs as glorious as that was, I also got to take out the trash. You see, our, our church uh, met in this community center that was used for, you know, weddings, bar mitzvahs, and every other occasion on the weekend. And so by the time we showed up Sunday morning, these 30-gallon barrels of trash were filled with 30 gallons of trash. Now, there was a way to take the trash out the side door that nobody would see but Jesus. And there was another way that you could take out the trash that everyone would go, oh. Look at the servant of God. What a holy person taking out the trash, serving Jesus. And I know right now you're wondering, which did you do, PB? <laughs> we'll just put that discussion on hold for a moment, shall we? Here's the idea. If you're serving to get accolades, applause, approval from people, affirmation, that's what you want. And that's what you're likely to get. But if that's the reward that you wanted, you shouldn't be expecting the heavenly rewards of being motivated for God's glory. Motive matters. And God will reward fairly. Second, uh, Jesus rewards generously. Jesus rewards generously. Uh, you see verse references to Luke 19 as well as Matthew 25. Let me explain. 
Here, you have these guys in the parable of the vineyard workers who have worked one hour, and they are receiving a full day's compensation for one hour's work. The point that Jesus is trying to make clear to us is that God rewards generously. Unexpected generosity, more than we could have ever anticipated, more than we could ever imagine. And to understand a, a more of a composite picture of how this rewards work, there's two other parables that Jesus taught uh, about the rewards that are given to workers. So we, we want to consider those with the idea that use God-given opportunities and your God-given gifts to serve him, and you'll be rewarded generously. So the first one is, is in Luke 19. It's called the parable of the minas. A mina represented about one-third of an annual salary. So a, a mina is uh, worth about three to four months of salary. And so in the parable of the mina, each worker gets one mina. The idea here is that each one has the exact same opportunity. And the point being that every day, each of us has the same opportunity to earn God's rewards in whatever he has called you to. And whatever you do that he's called you to, when you do it well to represent him, you are earning heavenly rewards. And each of us has the same opportunity. So if you choose to sleep for 14 hours during the day, that was your choice, right? And similarly, each of us, you think, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm not Billy Graham. I'm not Luis Palau. I'm not Greg Laurie. I don't get to do what they do. You don't have to. What you need to do is to be sensitive to what God is calling you to do. Each of us has opportunities that God has created in every realm of our lives. In the personal realm, when you spend time in prayer, when you spend time in Bible learning, when you spend time in fasting, when you seek to align your life and submit your will to God, when you say no to the flesh to say yes to God, you're earning rewards. In your marriage, when you seek to love your spouse as Christ has called you to love your spouse, when you seek to honor your spouse as Christ has called you to honor your spouse, you're earning rewards. Every time that you are dealing with your children and you sense that God's voice encouraging you to be gentle, God's voice encouraging you to be an example, God's voice encouraging you to raise them up in the training and the admonition of God, and you do it, you're earning rewards. In the workplace, some of you are blessed that in your job, you can represent Christ openly. Most of you, the majority of you, don't have that opportunity. But there I say that all of us, all of us, can listen and listen with a compassionate heart to our fellow workers, our fellow students. When somebody's struggling, we can listen. Each of us, your employer cannot say to you that you cannot offer to pray with your employees. They can't. And, and so each of us can start to bridge the conversation towards things of God. And each of us have opportunities to represent Christ. In our community, you think about this. You know that feeling when you're uh, coming into your neighborhood and you see your neighbors outside of their place. And you're thinking like, oh man, they're two houses down. I could just go into the driveway and I don't have to deal with them. Or I can open up the garage door and I don't have to deal with them. And then you sense God speaking to you and say, go ask them how they're doing. It's like, no, Lord, you know I've had a hard day. I don't want to do this. Right? We, we all have these opportunities that God has given, that God orchestrates, that are opportunities to represent him for his glory and our satisfaction in the local church. I, I have yet to hear of a local church say to a congregation, um, we want you to sign up for children's ministry, but there's a six-month waiting list, so we'll try to get you in someday to volunteer, right? There's always going to be opportunities, and each of us has them. And if with the right heart and the right motive, we, we go through and we can have the assurance that God is going to generously reward us beyond anything we could have ever imagined. Now, the other parable is found in Matthew chapter 25. That's known as the parable of the talents. Now, 
A talent was the largest weight of measurement in the Greek and Roman world. It's about 75 pounds in, in our culture. I'd go metric, but first of all, I don't understand metric, and none of you do either. So we'll just say 75 pounds, okay? But the term talent is now associated in our culture with gifts and abilities, God-given gifts and abilities in our case. And it comes solely from this parable. In the parable, each receives a different measure. One has five talents, the other has two talents, and the third has one talent. So you imagine 75 pounds of silver or gold, five times, two times, one time. And the master leaves his servants with these talents and says, I'll be back, use these to advance my interests. Does that sound like something that Jesus has done? A amen? Now, here's the thing. I want to encourage you. Um, don't covet someone else's talent, right? When, gosh, you know, Pastor Rob and Deanne and the team are leading us in worship, it's like, oh my gosh, Deanne, she sings like an angel. I, I wish I could sing. And Pastor Rob, he's so anointed when he leads worship. I wish I could do that. And, and this is, man, it goes all the way back to your childhood, right? Like if somebody got a new bicycle, you want a new bike. Then they got a new skateboard, you want a new skateboard. And, and then you grew up and you had blonde hair and then you wanted to have brown hair and somebody with brown hair wanted to have blonde hair. And if you had green eyes, you wanted blue eyes. If you had blue eyes, you wanted green eyes. If you had brown eyes, you just wanted somebody else's eyes. <laughs> uh, you know, so it's like we're just not satisfied with what God gave us. And I want you to understand, listen, God has given every single person here gifts you are uniquely designed by God, and those gifts are intended to advance his kingdom. There are people that you will reach that the person next to you is incapable of reaching. There are things that you can do that the person next to you could never do, and, and simply discovering how we can use those gifts to advance God's kingdom is key, and being willing to do it. And if we knew how much he was going to reward us for that, we would be so motivated to do it. And that's one of the things that makes the body of Christ beautiful. Uh, in our neighborhood group, I, I love that every person there comes with different perspective, different values, different gifts. Man, the, there's one lady who is like the queen of the snacks. I rejoice. Because every time she's slotted to bring something, it's like amazing, you know? Spring rolls, pierogi. I don't even know how to pronounce that word correctly. But it was amazing, right? And, and then, you know, there's a dude in the group who's like the king of handyman stuff. Um, that's not my gift. There has not been a Jewish handyman for 2,000 years. Right? <laughs> right? There's no Jewish gardeners, no Jewish handyman. Uh, you know. uh, but, uh, man, just, you know, to see the beauty of the body of Christ coming together to understand these gifts and, and then to use these gifts. We should be motivated to use these gifts for God's glory. And then to understand that Jesus rewards graciously. Jesus rewards graciously. Uh, back in Matthew chapter 19, beginning at verse 25, uh, the disciples are really puzzled because this rich man walks away and Jesus says to him that for a wealthy person it is like a camel going through the eye of a needle to actually receive Christ in his kingdom because the tendency is to covet the tendency is to trust in your wealth the tendency is to look to your riches to bring satisfaction and the disciples are surprised because they see material wealth as a sign of God's blessing and so they say well then who can be saved and Jesus responds at verse 25, he says, with men, this is impossible. Salvation is impossible. You can't buy it, you can't earn it. But then Jesus says, but with God, all things are possible. And then Peter like, hey, Lord, we gave up everything to follow you. What's in it for us? And Jesus begins to assure him not only of eternal life, but of the rewards that will come a hundredfold. Now, to understand this parable in the sense of salvation, if we were looking at that work day as representing one's life, there are some who started serving God very early. 
Then there were others who, who came and started serving later and later. Those at the 11th hour, near the end of their life, came, and, and they received the same reward of eternal life. Not the rewards that they would experience that would be enjoyed in heaven, but they have the same reward of eternal life, even though they didn't receive Christ until the 11th hour. Just like the thief on the cross when Jesus said to him, today you will be with me in paradise, right? That if you can still fog a mirror, bro, it is not too late. Praise God. And similarly, it is not too early. That is not until you receive Christ that you begin to experience relationship with him and his love. And you begin to earn these rewards which should motivate us as we begin to understand the grace of God. It is impossible for us to be saved through our efforts. But we're reminded it's a gift of God. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, we're told that by grace you've been saved through faith in Christ. And that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, so no one can boast. When we understand this great gift of salvation, that should motivate us in and of itself to want to serve God. <coughs> now, a couple thoughts I, I, I want to share with you along this way. Uh, when I first served the Lord, it was the sense that I need that accountability to grow. It was incredibly, incredibly helpful in development and growth as, as a follower of Christ. And I would encourage each of you, if you're not finding a place to serve in a local church, to do so. But then, uh, as I began to understand God's grace, uh, as I began to understand the gospel, the motivation became far and more in responding to God's love, that I wanted to serve God and serve others in an effort to serve him, just in response to his love for me. But um, along the way, uh, peers and mentors uh, encouraged me that, you know, Bruce, you, you got a calling on your life to be a pastor. Now, I wasn't trying to be a pastor. It was nothing I was striving to be. I was really content serving God and being an attorney. And yet it became really apparent even to me that God had called me to this. I was the last person that anyone would have thought would have become a Christian, let alone a pastor. One of the things that I can encourage you is that um, I have no regrets. No regrets at all. And I, I'm I'm not suggesting that vocational ministry, uh, ministry where you're being uh, paid a salary, is, is the only form of service. That, that's the last thing I'm suggesting. What I'm saying to you is when I stepped away from law to this calling, I don't regret it, even though obviously the, the compensation package was, let's just say, from an earthly standpoint, more beneficial, right? Um, but when I began to understand this concept of heavenly rewards, and I began to understand how I was accruing these heavenly rewards, then it became critical for me. And here's the reason why. Um, as, as difficult as being a trial attorney can seem or, or is, um, compared to being a pastor, being a trial attorney is easier uh, because they're, in the context of the courtroom, people can be hurting and you don't have to care. In the community of faith, we don't have that liberty. And ministry magnifies. The highs are higher and the lows are lower. And in a, a church this size, the, the stuff that, that comes up every single week, and I'm, I don't want to sound like a complainer here because my purpose is not to complain. What I want to tell you, and I'm just confessing, I just want to be honest with you, is through the 25 plus years I, I've served as a pastor through the 20 years that I've been here, there's been more than one occasion that I wanted to toss in the towel. And if I'm completely honest, the number of occasions probably exceed both hands and all my toes. <laughs> and knowing that not only was I, I called to this, not only did I need this for accountability and to grow, not only was I doing this in response to God's love for me? But I have been comforted knowing <laughs> that there are rewards that I'm going to experience 
for eternity. Now just check this out. When Jesus talked about these rewards in uh, Matthew 19, 27, he explained that everyone who had sacrificed for him to advance his kingdom would receive not only eternal life, but a hundredfold increase. Now just check this out. Most of you, if you were getting a 10 to 15% return on your investments, would be stoked. That'd be awesome. Now even if you got 100%, that would simply be doubling. What Jesus is offering is a hundred times. Now, there might be somebody here who is like a tech guru who wants to start up some tech company that's going to go public, and you're projecting in your mind the billions that you're going to get on your investment. And that would be glorious. So you're sitting here right now thinking like, well, I think I can do better than a hundred times, Pastor. What about that? Praise God. But let me just encourage you about this. How long would it take before that was gone? And you're thinking like, well, you know, I couldn't spend the billions even if I wanted to, so I'm going to give it to my kids. Right. How's that working? Right? You give billions to a kid who's never had to work a day in his life, good luck with that. All right? No, I'm going to set up a trust. I'm going to set up a foundation. And how many generations would that likely be impactful for good? And the alternative Christ has promised that everything you've done from the moment you received him that's done with the right motive is earning treasure in heaven that you will experience for eternity. You never have to worry about it depleting. You never have to worry about it being stolen. When you get to heaven and you experience like, oh my gosh, this is better than Hawaii. Duh. And yet, because... We want something that is tangible, that we can hold in our hands, that we can have some sense of security. We keep trying to find heaven on earth through our possessions, working for something, thinking that if I can just find the right benefit package, just find the right place of employment, just find the right employer, just be self-employed and do my own thing, then I'll be content. And because we find ourselves in that experience and we're so focused on this world, we cannot realize the goodness, the fairness, the generosity, and the graciousness of our Father. And I just want to encourage you, as many of you will be contemplating choices about who you want to work for and where you want to work, choose wisely. Choose to work for Jesus. The benefit package is the best. The work environment is the greatest. And you will never regret those choices in this life and the life which is to come. Would you join me in prayer? If you're here today and you've never received Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's not until you surrender your heart to choose to follow him that you begin to engage in the Father's business. And Jesus wants to encourage you not simply because of benefits and rewards, but because of his great love for you. That even though you were separated from God, that Jesus came, took the penalty for your sin and mine on the cross, proved it in the resurrection so that we could know that we could experience life with God and experience purpose and meaning in this life and the life which is to come. This is the gospel message that we're saved by Faith in Christ, it is a gift from God, it's his grace. And if you'd like to receive that gift right now, it's available to you, just let him know. And to the many of us who have been so sidetracked with trying to live for this world, seemingly so busy and overwhelmed with the demands of this world that we have neglected the opportunities and the gifts that God has given us to advance his kingdom, Lord, would you wake us up to see that Working for you is the greatest place where we can serve. And Father, we trust that you will give us those opportunities as we seek you. And we ask that you would do that now. Reward your people who love you and seek to serve you. And we ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>